Good morning, friends. Today is an interesting day, I think, as we talk about the Indian economy here. Uh, I think the budget speech will be starting any time soon. So I thought that when I was asked to speak to all of you about the Indian economy and its changes in it in the last three or four years of this government, I thought it would be first prudent for me to at least give you some context of what India is and what the Indian economy is before we delve into what this government has been trying to do in terms of its economic reforms. To put it in context, we are a very large economy. India is the seventh largest economy in the world. We are today a $2.5 trillion economy. So if you look at the Committee of Nations, which is some 160 countries in the world or thereabouts, we are on nominal terms, and which, is, which is in real dollar terms and not in, and not in the real purchasing power parity sense, but in nominal terms, the seventh largest economy. So... At $2.5 trillion, we, out of the $70 trillion global economy, we constitute uh, a, 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 you know, a, a significant chunk. But more importantly than that, we are growing at somewhere between 7% to 10%. So let's take, on an average, for the sake of basic mathematics, about 8%. What that means is that India adds $200 billion, $200 billion every year to the global, to its GDP. That's India's incremental addition to, the, to, to its GDP. Now, that is the size of, mid, that will probably be the size of majority of the nations. It's bigger than what their annual GDP is. So what we are incrementally adding every year to our GDP, that is the size of many countries in terms of their GDP. So when you look at the Indian context, you must always be aware that this is not a normal economic conversation. What happens in India is not normal stuff, even from global uh, standards. It is something that was radically changing, not just India, but will change the world in the next 10, 15, 20 years as the Indian economy grows. There is another interesting element to this, which is to give you a context of time. Okay? It took India close to 60 years. So we became independent in 1947. Around 2006-07, we crossed the one trillion mark, one trillion dollar mark in our GDP. So, as I told you earlier, majority of the countries, I think if you, beyond the first 10, 12 countries in the world, everybody is below one trillion dollar GDP. So, it took us 60 years to become a one trillion dollar GDP in about 2006, seven. In the next seven years, we became a two trillion dollar GDP. That is, we added another trillion for, for the first 60 years, in the next seven years. In the next five years, around 2019-20, we will become a $3 trillion GDP. And then in another four years after that, or three years after that, we will become a $4 trillion GDP, assuming around our current run rates. So, in terms of the global wealth creation, or the wealth creation that we are doing, this is, this is what not only countries but actually continents do over time and that and, and 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 we are shrinking that from what it took us 60 years to now in terms of five years and three years and successively two years so there is a lot of prosperity and uh, and an economic growth that india creates in absolute terms but there is another dimension to it that we're still a very poor country 
So while these numbers in absolute terms become huge, in India, at the individual level, on a day-to-day -day level, we don't see much of a change. We still see poverty. Today, India, on a per capita income basis, still stands at about $1,600 per, uh, per capita, which ranks as about 112th out of 164 countries in the world. So while in absolute terms we grow, on sort of micro terms, in day-to-day, in, in -day, it just still looks still a very poor place to live, a very poor place um, a, a, for each one of us to feel. And, 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 and that reflects in our rankings. And you keep hearing a lot of media, and, you know, sort of things about how really poor we are, whether in terms of our human development index, where we are 130 out of 188 countries, or in our human capital index, where we rank 105 still out of 130 countries, under five mortality, you know, malnutrition figures our education and our health delivery. So at the micro, we continue to face challenges which are very profound. And both these facts exist in parallel. The irony is that both these things are true. While India is a growing power, a, a economic power, a powerhouse, it is the world's sixth largest GDP, it is adding uh, uh, incremental growth of, of a magnitude and hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, at, the, at the micro level, because of its vast population, th this prosperity will take time to move uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the standards that developed nations are at, you know, which are today are talking in terms of thirty to $40,000 per capita income. So the, the trajectory that India is will, 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 will require a lot of time and effort in making difference to the lives of Indians. Now, that's the context in which India exists. It is in this context that in 2014, we had a new government under Mr. Modi. And under him, another change was launched in terms of India's economic reforms. So, You know, if you think about it, he was he inherited this challenge of a of a of a of a of a big country with its problems, and has tried to move it towards uh, a new direction uh, in the last four years now. And therefore, in today's context, people will talk to you if you go and, will go on switch on the television today. There will be a lot of debates, and you know, on how the budget is, and a lot of print media tomorrow in terms of you know, specific elements of the budget. But if you stand away from it and try to understand that what are the contours of Mr. Modi's economic reforms and what does that mean for India, you start to see a few trends. The first trend that you see, and for all of those who, are, who watch India closely or are living in India, you will find that the first biggest trend that we saw was that there is a trend of what we call as a breakout thinking. This is the first time that India has started to think really big in terms of where and how and what it wants to achieve. And you can see the Prime Minister in a series of announcements, I think close to about 46 or 47 announcements from Make in India to Jandhan Yojana to, you know, uh, Namami Gange to Smart Cities. It's talking about big. And, uh, and this is important because for a country of India's size, this thinking big is important if you have to move the trajectory from a, from a, from a, from a $2 trillion to a $4 or a $5 trillion. This is not, as I told you earlier, something that normal nations do. So before you can get there, you have to excite your people to be able to move on that journey of, of breakout thinking. Actually, before, before I get into it, there's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. You know, the, the, to understand Mr. Modi's economic reforms in the context of two words that I will share with you. The words are shared prosperity. We must create prosperity, but that prosperity must be shared. So. The, the, the shared prosperity's first element was breakout thinking. Secondly, if that was the objective, if that is the objective, then he decided that the way I'm going to do this 
is going to follow a, 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 a two-pronged approach. What I, what, what I call as a top-down approach and a bottoms-up approach. The bottoms-up approach was about inclusion, was about, it was about including the Indians who were at this per, who are at this per capita income of $1,600 in this economic growth. So that was the bottoms-up approach, and I will explain to you the elements of that. And then there was this top-down approach, which said that prosperity must be created by accelerating uh, growth, which means how do we think about unlocking our resources, what do we think in terms of attracting investment, into how do we create a banking system, a corruption-free environment, a shift in industry uh, from services towards manufacturing, how do we think about modernizing agriculture. So following it from, from, from a, from a top-down approach, which is economic growth, and follow, bringing it up from the bottoms up and saying this economic growth must lead to shared prosperity. So let's talk about first in terms of removing barriers to the economy or what I call as sort of the top-down approach. In the top-down approach, his first element was that very early in his regime, he said, I must get out or I must unlock the resources that the state controls and I must put them out in the economy for the economy to start using them as inputs for growth. So what did he do? He auctioned about $30 billion through uh, the coal auction process. He we, we released about $26 billion through telecom spectrum allocation. Another $40 billion through oil and gas output. We put out the resources of the state and increasingly you are seeing uh, the state getting out of the economic activity, the last being the disinvestment of, of Air India. Uh, today is, there is speculation on the budget that many of the government PSUs will be listed onto the stock exchange and the ownership of that will pass away from the state to the, to the, to the citizens. But the idea is that the state controlled resources must be unlocked from the state and put out in the in the growth economy for it to stimulate growth. Second thing was that you can't accelerate growth without attracting investment. India needs capital. So India said, well, we don't have enough capital on our own self to be able to, pro grow, uh, to, be able to grow. So a great push has been made, and you see elements of that in Mr. Modi's foreign policy, in his outreach, including his recent trip to Davos, where he said, well, we need for foreign investment to come and participate in India's economic growth. And th that has already started to pay dividends in the last four to five years. India's, India is today the, uh, the, 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 the topmost country in terms of receiving uh, FDIs, or the foreign direct investment. Our rate of foreign direct investment growth has increased from about 30, $30, $35 billion is what we were attracting about four years ago to about... 65 to 70 billion dollars on a run rate this uh, in Iran. So we are increased, we've really literally doubled the amount of money uh, that foreigners are starting to put into India in terms of uh, investment and to try and be, uh, be, you know, accelerate the economic growth. The third element of this, of this of top-down approach was tax. So India suffered hugely in the last 70 years because we actually didn't have a common tax system. We weren't a common market. We had 26 states and we had 17 indirect tax laws. Every state had its own tax law. The goods and services tax that has been bought in was actually to uh, put this country into one tax net. And the, the, the key element of that was that it would be... a uh, uh, a progressive taxing, uh, taxation system where it would be a destination-based tax, multi-stage, and on value addition. And all these uh, indirect taxes were abolished and um, are, are now a, a, a sort of a uniform tax system w exists across the country. And obviously it is going through its teething problems and you must be hearing a lot of press and people talk a lot about it. But if you cut through the noise, what it actually means for India is that 
this will lead this act in itself will lead and this nobody disputes people may dispute its quantum but about somewhere close to 250 billion dollars to about 500 billion dollars in incremental gdp over the next 5 to 7 years so when i was talking to you in terms of 2 and a half trillion to 3 trillion to 4 and a half trillion just this measure by the government has actually added about 5 250 to 500 billion dollars of incremental so about literally close to 20% more 25% kind of basis points in the, in the, from where we started uh, it will also add about one and a half to two percentage increase every year in our GDP growth rate. But more importantly, it will reduce our production costs by about 10 to 12 percent, giving our businesses about a 10 percent margin in, in being able to be more productive and more profitable in the long run. Now, these again, in, in Indian context are very, very large numbers. The other thing that was, is very important, and here the, tra the, the attempt by the government has been good, uh, but, the, but the track record, we have still not seen uh, the kind of uh, output that was expected, was in this area of manufacturing. This is very, very important because India goes back to my earlier point that while we will be able to grow at the, at the, at the kind of GDP numbers that, that I had told earlier, we, this GDP will not lead to, share, to, to, to shared prosperity unless people get jobs. And the, the only place where people can get jobs in numbers that India needs and just by way of context, India needs to absorb a million people. That's about 10 lakh people every month if into the employment workforce. Now, India was able to grow to its $1 trillion GDP and even to some extent to its $2, to, to its $2 trillion increment by actually missing this whole employment because a lot of this growth was service sector based, which has led to a big skewed uh, 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 proportion in our in our overall GDP uh, 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 you know matrix uh, today manufacturing is only 16 percent of our GDP so out of the two and a half trillion dollar GDP 16 percent is you know close to about 400 billion dollars that's it that's all that India manufactures today and we need to be able to move that, economists think, somewhere between 25% to 30% of India's GDP. That means literally double the share of manufacturing. And this will, they believe, add about 100 million jobs uh, in the next four to five years. And this means that, in the, in the, in the, that, the, that, the, that manufacturing must grow at somewhere between 12 to 15% on an annual basis. Unfortunately, that has not happened in the last four years. India's share of manufacturing has marginally gone up from 17% to 18%. But that's also about, you know, 17 and a half. So very, very small uh, movement. Uh, you know, the make in India was uh, uh, objective is an important part of that. The idea was to be, that to be the rallying cry behind which manufacturing will move uh, uh, and become a mainstay. Uh, government has done a few things. It has obviously tried to, uh, you know, create a better uh, business environment, simplify procedures, simplify the FDI policy, corrected some duty structures, taken a huge impact, um, huge push in our defense production and procurement. Defense, India has a, India has a huge, you know, huge defense budget, one of the biggest defense budgets in the world of $53 billion, of which about 14 to $15 billion is, uh, is, 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 is equipment and materials that we buy. And it's ironical, it's ironical that after 70 years, a country that can send, uh, uh, you know, sp a space mission, just think about uh, monopolizing the, 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 the space, cannot even do basic things in terms of buys its basic guns and you know, equip, 
ammunition from overseas. So there is a big push in the what the government has called as the indigenous design, development and manufacturing policy within defense procurement. Oh, but without getting into the specifics of it, the point being big push needed in the manufacturing sector for India to be able to realize its, uh, its, its, its aspiration of increasing its per capita income and absorbing the labor force. Performance on it so far been sort of patchy. Good attempt, but constraints like you know, cost of capital, skill, manpower, innovation remain as bottlenecks um, uh, even now. Then there is this huge element of our top-down approach which uh, you must hear a lot about and you know, you hear it in the social context but it's also very, very important in the economic context which is this fight against corruption. You know, we saw elements of it the, that most of you felt individually uh, in the in the impact through this uh, method uh, through the through demonetization, but that was just one element of this fight against corruption. There are a whole host of actions that the government has taken in terms of uh, trying to go after corruption. Things like uh, there has been a big Supreme Court monitored SIT on black money with a lot of renegotiation of tax treaties for where black money was parked. Uh, there is a black money uh, uh, imposition uh, of Tax Act 2015, which makes it a criminal offense to slash black money overseas, penalty on real estate transactions, income declaration schemes, a whole host. The impact of this has been that India is slowly and gradually moving up on the uh, corruption ranking perceptions from its ranking of somewhere around the 90s to, 70, to 74, 75. Now, this is a long haul fight. You know, you, you will, people will argue, oh, there's still corruption in the system. And that's right, we are not there yet. But corruption is a very, very important economic uh, input in the growth of an economy. And while India could live with it when it was a sub $1 trillion economy, it was not ideal, and I'm not even arguing or debating the moral element of it. But the economic element of corruption is that it has the the economy pays a huge price in terms of innovation and uh, and and talent the biggest casualty of economic uh, the economic casualty of corruption is that it tra crowds out talent uh, good people leave the economy and believe that they cannot be stakeholders and we've seen that in the indian context the number of indians who have left for overseas and done so well in countries like the united states europe have left on the premise that Indian system was too corrupt for them to be able to be participants in a meritocratic based environment. So the fight against corruption is, 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 a, is a social fight but it has great economic implications because this corruption actually takes away um, uh, you know, huge elements of, 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 the, of a country's productivity. And um, uh, you know, there is a sense that about 25% of India's GDP was in the black money or the sort of the, the gray economy. And uh, attempts to this is to bring back that. Now, if, if you talk about a $2.5 trillion economy and, you know, 25% of that is, is uh, what, about 500-ish billion plus, that's a huge amount of incremental GDP that's going to come back. Now, it's not going to come back in terms of the political discourse where people said how many thousand rupees in people's bank accounts and all. But it's actually going to come back into the economy. Even when in demonetization, when people have argued and said, well, a lot of this money has come back, economically what it means is that money that was outside the system in the black money has actually come back into our banking sector and can now be used for the productive activities um, in, in the economic system. So, this is another very, very important element uh, uh, which, has, which will play an important role as India transitions from a, from a $2.5 trillion economy to a, let's say, a $5 trillion. And, 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 and therefore, this is one of the signature elements of this government's policy of trying to use its political mandate in terms of bringing down the level of corruption in the, in, in the country. Uh, Industry, as I, you know, I talked about manufacturing, uh, the very re closely related to that has also been the banking sector. And I won't dwell greatly into the in details of that because it, may, you know, it will be getting down to a micro level that some of you, those who are interested, can pursue it later. But 
you've got to understand that one of the biggest challenges that prohibits us from becoming a globally competitive uh, economy today is that we our cost of capital or the cost at which we take money uh, and our businesses or get money is still very high which uh, makes it difficult for the indian entrepreneur or innovation or entrepreneurship in india to become globally competitive and um, uh, you know uh, reforming of the banking system to making it uh, is really an attempt to lower that cost of capital to be able to bring capital available to our businesses at a cost that allows them to compete with businesses in china and united states and in other parts of the world so there is a concerted attempt in that direction a uh, uh, slow change but i think over the next 2 to 3 years we will start to see the impact of that so at one end there was an element of effort to try and bring all these things that push india's economy in the in in a growth trajectory of you know somewhere between 7 to 10% potentially at 10% and that would allow greater wealth to be created but greater wealth create creation in the indian context uh, does you know uh, and that's again the uniqueness of indian context is because we're talking in such huge numbers that is 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 important is vital but is not enough because even if you start creating this wealth but it stays confined to only a very few people then uh, the rest of the nation uh, feels uh, left out in this economic growth you know and then we and then we see that we see that in even today we see that when we are in delhi the level of economic growth that you see around this area and then if you drive 50 70 80 kilometers out of delhi you start seeing the levels fall very quickly and that makes you wonder that you know uh, how skewed this this economic uh, economic growth will be and how and then you start seeing when many other social manifestations from violence to to rioting to crime against women because of because because of the level of economic prosperity actually dips in in not not uh, incrementally but exponentially so it is important that while we create and and, and if we don't do that it can lead to other many uh, social uh, disorders including uh, you know at at one end where we see the 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 the, the violence of of mausum to to crime because you can't have islands of prosperity in 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 in, in a sea of poverty and and hunger so it was important for the government or it's important for any government of the day to uh, think of economic growth but also think of it as i told you in terms of shared prosperity we have to make every indian uh, a stakeholder in this economic growth now this will slow our economic growth it is inevitable it will slow our economic growth but it is important for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, you know for the country for the, for the for the social fabric of the country to remain uh, united in in uh, while we make this economic journey um uh, you know it's it's just like you can't leave behind anybody so far behind that they don't get a chance to catch up and here again uh mr modi made financial inclusion or inclusion uh an a an a very important part of of the of his strategy and here i think um you know irrespective of people's uh, political um, orientation the the progress that this country has achieved in the last 3 to 4 years is unprecedented globally i mean you just have to look at the numbers to understand what the staggering impact of this has happened and i'll share with you some of these numbers just to give you some perspective in 2011 about 250 million households in the country so that's about had access Uh, sorry out of out of 250 million households in the country about 145 million had access to banking so about 58% of the country in the rural areas it was about out of 170 million so we have a larger number of rural population about 90 million households had access about 54% in the urban which was smaller about 80 million households about 53 million had access to banking that is these people knew what a bank was needed uh, uh you know there was about 67% but on an average about 58% of the country had access to banking so after 70 years of independence 
about more than 40% of the country had no access to banking. Not that it was not tried, but government and state's capacity to make an impact. In 2011, the last government made an attempt. Government machinery was mobilized, effort was made. 74,000 villages with population of about 2,000 were covered with banking facilities. About 74,000 villages were we were able to reach. So assume that even if they were, you know, uh, you know, to, you know, to be multiply that by, you know, we were able to reach to receive about a uh, uh, couple of million households that we were able to add. Then in 2014, the Prime Minister came and said, I am not going to wait for this incremental. The 74,000 villages is not good enough. We are going to go and make a, a, a war effort. And most people thought that was not possible because you know you were still talking in terms of hundreds of millions of households that had never, and these are households, these are not even individuals that we will be able to bring uh, uh, banking facilities to. In four years, we have, this government has now touched, has opened 308 million bank accounts. 180 million in rurals and about 126 million in urban. More than what we achieved in the first uh, 75 years of independence with everything has been achieved in the last four years. As of them, I'm telling you numbers as of 3rd January 2018. 232 million these uh, debit cards, rupee debit cards, rupee have been issued to people. And when this started, these bank accounts were zero bank accounts. Banks resisted and said, we can't open these bank accounts because these are poor people. They don't need to be banked. It's too costly to maintain their bank accounts. They're illiterate. We don't want their banking business. Today, government of India has mobilized $12 billion in these bank accounts. These bank accounts, when they started, I think only 30% of them were, or 20% of them were, uh, had any, even a single rupee in them. Today, about 90% of them are being used, have, are not zero bank accounts. So think of it, from 74,000, that was the kind of number of impacts we were making in 2011. In 2018, 181, uh, sorry, 300, and mil, 300 million households in, or individuals into this banking system with new bank accounts, virtually covering the entire population. Now for the first time, every Indian has a bank account and we are able to reach the benefits of economic prosperity to them. We still have to do the growth, but we have been able to include them in every uh, subsequent uh, activity that we now. One element of that was being this uh, direct benefit transfer. You know, the government gives a lot of subsidy to poor people. So this subsidy used to go from Delhi, and as every prime minister, as if everybody said, what happens in India for every one rupee that left Delhi, only 10 paisa used to reach the ultimate beneficiary. So somewhere between 90 paisa to, you know, egg paisa, well, you know, was eaten by intermediaries. Then you saw them in people in the, the, the touts in the ration shop to the, to the somebody when you went to get a death certificate to somebody, you, got to, you know, the, every, every benefit that was ultimately supposed to reach um, an individual or a, or, or a citizen of this country, uh, this was the majority of that. Uh, was consumed by, by, by graft and by, by, by intermediaries. Now, the, once you were able to have these Janda and Yojana accounts, you, were, you started the thing of being able to transfer the benefits of the economic growth or the economy directly to these people. And there again, the numbers are just staggering. I mean, from, you know, today the government has saved about, about 57,000 crores of money that was getting wasted between being sent from Delhi and being able to reach the individuals. And I, you know, if I look at the numbers, today the number of beneficiaries that were receiving this in 2013, only 10 crore beneficiaries were being able to access this through direct benefit. Today that number has gone to 65 crore people. And the, so that's about 65 or 60, 65 percent of India's population that is now reaching these benefits directly. This is something you and all don't see. We don't read about it in the newspapers. Nobody talks about it. You know, 
this kind uh, because it's not politically uh, uh, interesting it's not but this is the impact that is happening and the lives of individuals uh, in terms of their inclusion that in terms of you know the direct benefit is from from the quantum was about sort of 7000 crores i'm just giving you the numbers not to uh, you know do it with data but just to give you the magnitude that number today in 2013 if you were sending 7000 crores through direct benefit today we are sending 95000 crores that is 13 times enhancement in 4 years so again put it in context we were a trillion dollar gdp in 70 years we are now accelerating what took our parents and our grandparents 70 years to do in the next 4 to 5 to 2 years that is the kind of incremental wealth we will create in the next five years, four years. So there will be huge prosperity. But this prosperity, we are now opening up the arteries. So we are clogging up the arteries where this money went through black money, through graft, we are going to, you know, through multitude, close those, those, those tributaries by blocking those channels and open up new channels where this prosperity can sh be shared with citizens in a legitimate way through opening bank account, direct benefit transfer, mudra scheme, etc. So change what I call as the architecture. You know, if, if there is a, if, you th if there those of you are engineers, you understand this concept of circuit. You know, you produce energy and you light a bulb. So you have to have a circuitry from where which, by which that energy must flow. So to be able to do this, to be able to, so to be able to do this in a national context, it was important that we, we create wealth, but we also create a circuitry for India's 21st century, and that's why he keeps talking about, you know, India at India at 75, India at 100 years. That when India transitions, that uh, that from to to its 75th or 100 years, this is not going to be a small transition. This will not be a transition that the world will not see, because this is the kind of transition that is swaying the 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 entire GDP of the world. You know, we are talking about from two and a half trillion dollars to, um, to, to, to sort of, you know, five trillion, nine trillion dollars. The only other example of this has been in recent times that of China, with a very different model. But this is this, this so, so this prosperity is coming. If, if, if you have a very good government, people work very hard, you know, it will, it will, it will become, it will come, we'll get it in a, we'll get it in a fewer years. We'll, if it, if you have not such a good government, you know, things aren't doing that well, it may take a little bit. But this prosperity is coming. But what was more important was that if this prosperity comes, if this indeed deluge of prosperity comes into India, do we have the receiving systems and the architecture to be able to do it in a manner that it is distributive, that allows the whole country to grow, or it ends up in a manner that we have these islands of prosperity with huge amounts of, uh, of poverty and then social problems that could lead to even uh, fragmentation of, uh, of, of nations, and nations have fragmented. The Soviet Union was an example of that, you know, when it opened up and it could not absorb the change that was coming. So I think the, the, the uh, to, to understand the, the economic uh, uh, you know, economic uh, sort of reforms in the last four years, you must think of really two terms. And, and then I'll close and I'll be open to ask any queer. I think I'm running out of time also. Is to think of it in two terms. Remember the term that we are moving towards a world of shared prosperity. And at least this first term of the Modi government has been in terms of changing India's economic architecture. And this, the, the, the circuitry of India's economic system. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a very complicated topic and a very detailed topic to be able to finish in whatever 30, 40 minutes I had. But uh, um, do feel free to ask me any questions and I'll, if nothing is clear, then I'll try to answer them in specific elements of that. I'm Kishan from Ashoka University. Hmm. Um, so post the global uh, financial crisis in 2008, a lot of central banks took many monetary stimulus. Uh, for example, the US uh, Bank of Japan, the Fed uh, and the European Central Bank, which had significant impact on developing economies, particularly our currency. How can we use multilateral stages to uh, curb such unconventional policies? For example, the quantitative easing and subsequent tapering. How can we avoid such uh, unconventional policies? Okay. Maybe I'll take one or two questions and then I'll answer. Uh, 
So, yeah, if I understood well, you were uh, recently in Davos, um, and you had an opportunity to address in association with SOCHAM um, on the sidelines of a plenary session. So, you have a very first-hand information what this Western people think about India. Uh, my impression is, of course, there has been a lot of positive impact in terms of economic and political and social networking with the Western world. But as you, as you have also ex uh, just explained, there's a still lot way, need a lot way to go forward. So keeping in mind the scenario, what the, what the government has completed in the, in the last three, four years, what is the way forward in terms of this Western people so that they come to India and invest in India in terms of the investing in the manufacturing side particularly. Thank you. Yeah, if you ask, I, I may ask, uh, meaning of one point, you have uh, definitely stressed on the manufacturing sector being a laggard, but then uh, what about agriculture? Because, you know, agriculture is also a very intrinsic, it's a very important part of the Indian economy, and yeah. it's a majority employer. Uh, and a lot of people are in that informal sector. So when I say agriculture, of course, government is doing a lot of measures to not let agriculture become a seasonal thing, which has been the thing of the past. If, if How much agricultural technology, for that matter, bringing the farmers to use the technology, which maybe they are not that much open to. So w do you think that would also spur the GDP in the longer run? Okay. Let me, let yeah, that's a very good question. and. Um, I will, I will take all these, these three questions in that order. So your first question on uh, quantitative easing and, and, and you know, what are some of the models that the West did to stimulate um, growth? See, those, those are not very relevant for India from an Indian context because we don't have a growth problem. Quantitative easing and some of the policies, and you know, there is nothing we can do about it because each of these countries will follow economic policies of their own. For us, that's, growth is not an issue, as I explained. You know, the, only the quantum of growth we can change. For us, um, having a non-inflationary growth is very important uh, because if growth happens at a very rate at which there is high inflation, in a poor country, that can make a lot of essential services uh, out of the reach of people. So we have to grow without while keeping our inflation in check. And I think in that, our um, Reserve Bank of India has done a sort of stellar role in being able to meander India through uh, periods of growth while trying to keep, uh, keep, keep inflation under control. Of course, we've had some ba bad periods and patchy periods. But, but we live in a world of comparative, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a comparative world, and when nations like the United States open up things like quantitative easing, it makes easier for them to become, uh, uh, you know, their businesses to become more competitive because their cost of capital goes down. Um, I think that, you know, this is a challenge. This is a challenge for like we all face in individual lives, and, you know, the, it's not a perfect world. And in an imperfect world with uh, even structural uh, constraints, we have to succeed. But what we have to do is that we have to continue to grow while keeping our inflation under control because going back to my earlier point, our growth only does not have a macro dimension, it also has a micro dimension, which is and inflation hurts the poorest people the most because they are the people who can least afford it. Your quiet question on, on, on DeVos, I think, uh, yes, I mean, when I was there, I think that there was, there was just so much, I mean, and it's good. It's good that in India, in some sense, we have a, a little bit of a negative, you know, we are, we are never happy with ourselves and we constantly keep criticizing ourselves. That's a good sign of progressive societies. Uh, we shouldn't do it too much, but it, by and large, you know, but when you step outside India and when you step outside to see practitioners, you know, as I've told you, the, the amount of FDI in India is doubling. We are the highest FDI received destination in the world. They just don't understand. They think of this as a huge opportunity. They are looking and saying, my God, you are, at 7% you are adding uh, whatever, 200 billion. At 9% you are adding 250 billion. Either case doesn't matter. This is just too huge for us not to be part of it. So everybody wants to come. Everybody wants to invest. Everybody wants to uh, be part of this part of this story. I mean, it is, you know, pen pension funds of Canada so that the Canadian fireman and a Canadian nurse, when they retire 25 years from now, is investing their money in India so that their uh, old age is secure, right? I mean, that's the kind of money that's coming to India in terms of growth. So India, 
growth, as I told you earlier, is also going, eh, going to happen, and you know, irrespective. But I think where your point was that what should India do? Yes, India needs to be continuously, relentlessly in improving uh, itself all the time. You know, now, in many areas, we have, we have done one of the bigger changes. Every now people talk about this whole budget every day. And unfortunately, like with every progress, after some time, progress becomes incremental. The same amount of effort is needed, but your progress that is seen is incremental, not exponential, because you've taken out the big, big reforms or the big changes. So I think now, for example, one of the things India will have to crack is its manufacturing. We still haven't found a USP by with which we can go to the world. There was a USP for low-cost manufacturing that has been taken by China. There is no capacity for the world to absorb that. Now, what will be our USP? We are struggling. We are experimenting. We are trying. You know, there is no formula book that we can go to, and, and no matter what the economists of the world say, they even they cannot they cannot tell us what is what it is that we must do. But what we must do, we know, are a few elements which we, in a democracy difficult, but we, we have to improve our contractual terms. We have to improve our ease of doing business. We have to lower the cost of capital. We have to uh, get more innovation out. We can't give jobs to everybody, so we've got to be able to, um, you know, this mudra scheme, try, try many, many more innovations. Many innovations at India's, par, at India's cost point. At India, you know, so that those innovations can become businesses because the problem is you do an innovation but the cost point is only $1,600 per, uh, per capita income and in in average Indian's uh, income is only 10,000 rupees. So, well, you know, or whatever, 1,600, so, you know, you know that's about 10,000 rupees a month. So, what, what can you do? With, so, at 10,000, you have to bring the cost of production. You have to be able to make, be able to make the businesses viable at that. So, it's a, it's a strenuous job. It's a huge task. But India will have to continue to do it because if you do it, then the opportunity of that becomes huge. And that's what India is doing, by the way. You know, from low-cost delivery of satellites to, you know, lowest per, somebody was telling me that in India today airlines are becoming viable at the lowest per cost of a seat. You know, so we are developing, you, know, you may have to think of new aircrafts, and new aviation fuel that allows an aircraft to be able to succeed because after a certain amount, the people can't afford it. So if you want more Indians to travel, you have to bring down the cost of, of air travel. So India will become the lowest place, lowest cost. Nobody knows how to fly airlines on a, on a per seat basis as Indian airlines do. So that's a new innovation that's happening. So things like that. So India will have to continuously uh, do because India must not only become 2 to 4 trillion, but on a per capita basis, India must uh, ensure that its per capita income goes up from 1,600 to whatever, 10,000, 15,000 for it to become a developed country. Because that will have implications on things like nutrition, health, education, quality of life for an average Indian. So that, that, that process of that where manufacturing will play. And that go, leads me to the next question, which is a very important question. I wanted to cover it, but because of lack of time, I couldn't. But I'll tell is agriculture. See, today agriculture, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradoxical situation because we, have, we still have 58% of our population that depends on agriculture. You know, we have achieved hugely in terms of, does anybody even understand what, what the contribution of our agriculture is? People just, I'll give you a context and then this will be, then we, you know, then I'll explain. When we became independent, we were about uh, 30 crore people. And two big baskets of India's agriculture production, which were there, got taken away from us. On the west, which was our weed growing area, went to West Pakistan. And in the, the, the rice bowl of India was East pa went to East Pakistan. If you read history, you will find that between the 20s and the 30s, uh, and, and right up to the 40s, there used to be famines in India, where millions, like millions of Indians would die of hunger. Even if you leave aside the famine where Churchill uh, didn't let the ships dock and, and the Bengal famine, even beside that, which is a, millions of people would die. Now, fast forward that 70 years, we are 130 crore people, same piece of land, right? But today, Fortunately for us, you know, our, our stocks are overflowing and even if there is one death of, due to hunger, there is, a, there is a big national issue, which it should be. So with the same land, today our agriculture has delivered at the level 
that is needed for our country to be independent. Today, nobody dies of famine. India is not afraid that if we go to war, we don't have enough stocks of food to feed our people. So this is a huge contribution. Uh, and, you, know, you know, 130 crore people, same piece of land. But what it has done is that our agriculture, the, the common farmer has still not benefited from this growth. And this goes back to my again earlier point. Big growth in GDP, big output in numbers, but necessarily does not lead to transformation in the lives of people. Now, two things are holding us back of that. One thing is that, as, as you had only alluded in your question, was that we have not been able to, even after 70 years, we talk about good monsoons, bad monsoons. We're still dependent, uh, huge early, uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, on dependence on, on nature. Unfortunately, Atal Vihari Vajpayee in his last government had talked about interlinking of rivers because it's the only country where you have drought in one country and flood in the other, you know, at the same time. So, you know, water cannot be moved around because water was, uh, was, was, was on the concurrent list. It was also a state subject, you know. And, uh, so now th that project was shelved. And I think you had Mr. Suresh Prabhu who came and spoke to you yesterday. He was the man who was bought in 2002, 2003, moved to be able to come up with this project. And he had started work on this project when the government changed. And then for 10 years, we forgot about this project. Now this government has again restarted this project of trying to bring about the interlinking of rivers. That is extremely, extremely critical. While we do much work on the irrigation, to be able to really tap our waters to be able to bring about the uh, constant, uh, be able to bring terms of agriculture productivity. That's, that's, uh, that's an important element. And then there is a second element, which is again very complicated, very socially linked, goes back into hundreds of years of Indian history, is this whole system of uh, intermediation in the, in, the, in the Indian agriculture system, the procurement system, this whole mandi, uh, markets and, the, and, the, and the, the, the transparency whereby effectively whatever the farmer produces he doesn't even receive one tenth of the price at which we at which the consumer buys because there is a whole system that uh, that is intricately linked with our social system even including our caste system and, and it's existed in this country for hundreds of years the government has to dismantle that but it's a social issue it's also a political issue I, they, they're talking about that in terms of these e auctions e mondays this, this you know they're trying to disintermediate this thing this will be a this will be a laborious and a painful task but unless this is done uh, the benefits of uh, agriculture output will not be able to come to the individual farmers. In terms of innovation and technology, I think all of that is happening. I think as India becomes more innovative, and I was very happy that recently I had attended some conference of agriculturists, where they had said they had run a business case study across the country to select, uh, you know, from business school, ideas about agricultural innovation. And they were telling us that how boring can this topic be of, you know, just agricultural innovation. But surprisingly, they had 25,000 case studies presented to them, out of which they had selected like five or six. And the, and the panelists who were seasoned agriculturists who spent their lifetime in this field were shocked, they said, and surprised that the amount of ideas that were coming through uh, with about innovation and entrepreneurship of how we could innovate um, in at, at agriculture, uh, you know, for our agriculture. This was not about IT and stuff like that. This was about our agriculture productivity. So I think once we start unleashing this whole thing about innovation, we will start getting solutions. So while we are okay with in terms of our stocks and food, I think now we've got to be able to take this to the next level. And that's possible. Again, as countries have demonstrated, you know, whether it's the case of Netherlands, such a small country, but the second largest exporter of food products because they've gone all vertical. You know, or Israel that solved its water problem in the last 10, 12 years. So it's possible. I think India will have to will have to do that more so because in the foreseeable future also a large proportion of India's population will continue to be uh, tied to agriculture. But this is the challenge of democracy. That you know. It, 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 is, it, it will have to be done through existing uh, uh, systems uh, in, 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 in which, which have existed for years. And again, the Prime Minister here has shown a lot of innovation in trying to address it from different sources, from different ways.